Welcome back again to Solving Basketball. My name is Jordan Sperber, and today's guest is Fran Frischella. He is currently an analyst for ESPN, and he also has head coaching experience at Manhattan, St. John's, and New Mexico. Fran, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. No, it's a pleasure, Jordan. Uh, I always love talking basketball, especially with people who are as... um, let's say, as fanatical about the game as I am. So uh, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on. I call it nerdy. I say I, I call it nerdy. <laughs> yeah, I've never been called nerdy before, but it's kind of a badge of honor. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to think I'm going to take that. I think, I think I'm going to take that. Yeah. So I think that you have potentially listened to a couple episodes of the podcast here. <laughs> yes. and, and the first question for every guest is if we, uh. if we walked into a gym right now, I went under the basket. You went to the free throw line. How many would you make out of a hundred? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, I've heard you say that to uh, the likes of Baker Dunleavy and <laughs> my buddy Luke Yakovich, and of course John Shire. You know, in my day, I probably would say I could make seventy-five to eighty. But you know, I'm I'm sixty-one now, and I'd say if I could make sixty-seven percent, I would be extremely happy. But I would say somewhere in the sixties right now. But uh, it's a good it's a good question. I think I would probably tire out after a while. But uh, I think the longest streak I had when I was a young a youngster playing in the playgrounds of New York, um, I think I once made sixty eight in a row, which you know isn't bad. I, I didn't consider myself a great shooter, but uh, I once made sixty eight free throws in a row. But that's about it. I don't. I haven't had a chance to do that in a long time. <laughs> I I usually try to research a little bit to see the playing background or potentially shooting yeah. background. I could not find much about about no. uh, your your playing experience. I I grew up in Brooklyn. I played at James Madison High School. I went to Brooklyn College, which was Division three at the time. I could have played on the team, but right uh, right before my freshman year. In high school, in college, believe it or not, my varsity coach asked if I would come back and somewhat unofficially co- coach the junior varsity at my high school. So as a 19-year-old kid, I was uh, helping. Co- I actually coached the junior varsity team at my high school um, for a couple of years. And then as a senior in high school, I was so anxious, excuse me, in college, I was so anxious to get out of college and start coaching. I was one of those guys, Jordan, that worked summer camps at North Carolina and all the big like East Coast camps, uh, the, the Rob Kennedys, the Kennedy family, Pocono Invitational, University of Rhode Island camp. Um, I did all these camps, and my senior year in college, I was an assistant coach at New York Tech, a Division II team out on Long Island. The head coach was a, a neighbor of mine from Brooklyn. And we went to the Division II National Championship game, lost to Virginia Union on ESPN uh, back when ESPN was just starting in 1980. And uh, the very next year, I was hired at Rhode Island, and I was 21 years old. And I think I'm pretty sure I was the youngest full-time assistant in the country. So um, I got started coaching at a very relatively young age and uh, was more of a pickup playground player. But uh I, I love playing. I actually got better uh, once I got into coaching and had time to be in the gym. But uh, coaching has always been my passion once I realized I wasn't going to be a great player. What is basketball? What is what is, what is, what is, is it? Basketball? Is that basketball? What is What is basketball? Let's start with your coaching experiences. In particular, yeah. I wanted to ask you about X's and O's. So I'm yeah. a little young to have watched uh, a Fran Fraschilla head coach team, and I'm curious what yeah. what were you running? Let's let's start with offense. Yeah, I was a I was a set play quick hitter guy. Um, one of the things that I I try to tell young coaches all the time is don't try to be great this is as young head coaches don't try to be great at everything. Uh, if you try to be great at motion offense and set plays and zone offense and inbounds offense and, you know, press offense, if you, you just don't have time in a practice to be great at everything. So you got to pick out 
two or three things that you want your team to be great at on each side of the ball. And you have to be good and proficient at the other things, you know, press offense, uh, OB plays. But to me, it was about our secondary break, which we ran. And I used to say our, fa- our secondary break, not our fast break, our fast break was where we tried to get, you know, outnumber you. But once we flowed into secondary break and the defense had four or five defenders back, that was our half court offense, but we were running it from the full court. And then, um, I was a set play guy. I was the kind of guy that ran a lot of misdirection plays would start out looking like they were going one way, but they really came back another way. Um, I like to run the same play in five or six different sets to disguise them. And there would be a time during the season where we might have 50 or 60 or 70 plays in. And someone would say, how do you, how do you guys remember all those? Well, it's just like in football, we really had five or six or seven key actions, but we just tried to disguise them in different sets. So our guys got proficient at that. And, and um, the last thing I would tell you is, uh, and I just tweeted this out, one thing I learned about offensive basketball that I learned from a guy named Sonny Smith, uh, he was the former coach at Auburn, he coached Charles Barkley, he coached at VCU. Sonny was a great X and O guy, and he taught many of us, and I took it to heart, Design your offense with the missed shot in mind. In other words, of course, you're going to run offense to get great looks, whether it's in the paint or for a jump shooter. But where are your best rebounders when the shot goes up? And can you manufacture offense off of your offensive rebounding? So um, those are the things offensively I really believed in. And, um, you know, at the expense, let's say, of running – Lots and lots of motion offense because, again, you can't be great at being a set play coach and a motion coach. You got to pick one or the other, and then you got to really be proficient in that area. And that was kind of the philosophy I had. You mentioned the offensive rebounding there. I, I don't know if you're aware, but Ken Pomeroy has backfilled some years, and and uh, he has 1997 and 1998 on there. And you guys were yeah. num- number two in offensive rebounding percentage in 97 and number one in, in 98 at St. John's. I, di- I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's a great stat. It, it, it's in keeping. I, I never knew that. But uh, I do remember a game in 1998. It was my second year, and we finally got uh, St. John's back to the NCAA tournament. And uh, I, can, I can remember beating Seton Hall in, in the Meadowlands in New Jersey I think we shot 21% for the game. <laughs> and, if I, and if I recall, we set a Big East record that night for rebound margin. It was like 62-31. But it was basically born out of the fact that we were a bad shooting team. And so we had to figure out a way to get the ball back as much as possible. And we really concentrated on offensive rebounding. And a lot of it, as I said, came out of our set. So there you go. You know, the proof's in the pudding, I guess. <laughs> There you go. You started by saying that don't try to be great at everything as a head coach. Pick pick three yeah. things. So my question for you is how important is it what three things you pick versus um, how you're teaching and executing and developing those three? Like, would you spend what? more time as a coach making sure your three things are the right things or how to teach those? You know, that is a, uh, I'm not just saying this, that's an unbelievable question Um, because you just made me think about it for the first time. And what I would tell you is as a young coach, depending on who you've been influenced by. And in my case, my, the three guys I worked for were Rick Barnes, Gary Williams, a hall of famer. uh, You know, I I worked for him at Ohio state and Danny knee at Ohio. U had great success there later went on to coach Nebraska. And so when you're a, when you're an assistant coach, especially when you're or you're a player who played for a great coach, you're constantly evaluating what you're learning from those pe- your mentors, and you're you're gradually um, you're gradually developing on your own a coaching philosophy of how you believe the game will, should be played when you become a head coach. So to your point, I always value toughness on the defensive end. Um, so to give you an idea, uh, defensively, we played 98% man to man, even back 20 years ago, we switched a lot, 
but we didn't switch out of convenience. We switched to take offense away from the opponent. I was big on that. Uh, and rebounding was part of our DNA. So on the defensive side, those three things were critical to us. You know, the, the, the toughness of man to man, the I would call scouting report defense, which involves switching, taking away opponent's strengths. And I really believe like you hear football coaches say this all the time, make a team play left-handed, you know, make them do things they're not used to doing. And I, I really feel that way about basketball. What is the opponent's strength and how do we take that strength away so that they have to go to something else that they're not as good at? That's the Belichick theory of defense right there. And then rebounding, I just feel is always part of toughness. And so on the offensive end, we wanted to try to get easy baskets with our fast break, flow into our secondary break to keep the defense off balance, and then, you know, run run offense uh, that, you know, that got our best player shots. And a lot of that had to do with misdirection, tricking the defense, et cetera. But to your point, those keys to my coaching philosophy, uh, whether it was three on each side of the ball, was a result of thinking the game as an assistant and figuring out the game based on what I thought was going to be important for my teams to win. And I, I, there are things that Gary Williams did every day in practice that I said, well, I'm not going to do that when I'm a head coach. You know, that's not the way I want to do it. Or Danny Nee or Rick Barnes. Uh, so you, as a young coach, in order to determine what, what's important to you, you really have to evaluate the game uh, who you are, how you're teaching, and and have a vision for what the end result looks like. See, even if you haven't ever called a play in a game yet, Jordan, you in order to become a really good head coach, especially with no experience, you have to have a vision of what good basketball looks like. And I always tried to have that vision in my head. How much do you think a coach, that, that vision should change throughout his career or stay the same? Because... So Gary Williams, was he running, yeah. was he running flex offense when, when you were with him? Yeah. Yeah. Gary's one of the few guys that I could honestly say stayed within with his system, basically his whole career and had great success with it. He believed in it. He, it, it was sound, you know, it was, he was a great teacher of it. So yes, to your point, you know, there's a guy that made the hall of fame that taught the same system for whatever it was, 30 plus years. I don't think you can really do that anymore unless you are so ingrained in and, and, and what you do and teach it so well, and you still have to adjust. The Princeton offense, for example, mm. you know, uh, it has taken on so many iterations. In fact, I was thinking of this last night because I just put out a video on Tara Vanderveer's uh, little uh, elbow action in the Princeton offense, and if you really think about it, and I'm old enough to know this and do the research, much of the Princeton offense came from a guy named Butch Van Bredikoff in the 50s at Lafayette College. His point guard was a guy named Pete Carrill. When Butch went to Princeton in the 60s, his assistant coach was Pete Carrill. So even though we all credit Pete Carrill with the Princeton offense, it started with Butch Van Bredikoff and probably before that, but the point is, that system, as good as the Princeton offense is, if you follow Joe Scott or Bill Carmody or anybody who's ever run it, um, it evolves. And I do think that as a coach, you can't coach one year 10 times if you have 10 years of experience. You have to get 10 years of coaching experience. And I think that if I were still coaching today, I would have certainly adapted to all of the things that we've been learning here in recent years and guys like you are promoting that with your videos, um, spread, pick and roll, which I saw in Europe over the last 15 years. Um, you know, all the switching that's going on, uh, counters to switching. I think the game's become way more sophisticated in the last 15 or 20 years because of video, because of the fact that coaches are studying the game closer. And because when you see something that's hard to guard, you have to have an answer for it. And then when it becomes, you know, you know, when somebody has a, a defense that's hard to score on, you have to have an answer for that. So the game keeps evolving, and I think a good coach has to evolve with the game. Yeah, so that makes a ton of sense to me. And, and, and sticking with something like the Princeton offense, I watched the Princeton, and 
you can just see how good those coaches are, how much, how many reps they have at teaching the system and, and knowing every read and, and then getting their players to execute yeah. it. But then I also watch it sometimes and think this doesn't necessarily make sense in 2019, given what we know yeah. about ball screens and about spacing and, and to be so dedicated to this system. Uh, so it's it's yeah. the trade off there, right, between doing or er, t- the execution and then modernizing. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you have to read the defense, and if the defense makes an adjustment, you have to have and great coaches do this an adjustment to the adjustment. And oftentimes, my my friend Mike Michael Lombardi, who's got incredible NFL experience. He says about NFL coaches, sometimes they play. They, we used to have a game when I was a kid called Battleship. And, you know, you couldn't see the other guy's board. He had his, he had his, he had his, his battleships on his board. He couldn't see your board. You couldn't see his. And the board was aligned like from, from A to A to Z and then from 1 to 20 across. So you would say like B6. And if there was a, a battleship there, he would have to say hit. Like, you hit my battleship, you know? Um, and then he would go to you, uh, D11, up, oh, you missed, you know, because you had your ships on that on your little grid there. Well, coaches call plays like that. They just, they'll just just run a play without any regard for how the defense is defending it. And the great coaches adjust to what the defense takes away. And I, I would think, to answer your question about the Princeton offense, when I watch Jokic now, and some of the great passing big guys in college and in, in, in NBA and in Europe, and everybody's five out now. This is all, you know, and uh, whether it's playing at the high post or, uh, you know, uh, corner action with, uh, you know, with your uh, post and the elbow cutters, this is, this is all the way the game keeps evolving. I mean, and again, it's all about what the defense is trying to take away and how you adjust to it. So, I would think anybody who runs the Princeton offense would you know, well would have the ability to read what is trying to be taken away and just adjust to it. Um, you know, it's really that simple. If you take away my ability to come dribble handoff, um, that that player is going to back cut. If you soften up on the worried about the back cut, then we're going to DHO you and maybe shoot behind the screen or continue the action. So I, I just really think good coaches adjust to the adjustments. Makes sense. Sticking with kind of like the trends of of the game here, I'm curious as a historian of of the game like you are, one thing that I've done a lot of in my coverage is break down what I've been calling continuity ball screen. Some people call it Euro Mm -hmm. ball screen. Yep. Uh, And so (laughs) I don't really know the the exact genesis of of that in the college game specifically, but I'm curious if you know more about that. Well, I know Reggie Witherspoon up at Canisius now yep. uh, has run this for a while, and I believe Todd Kowalczyk also did a videotape for championship. But I will tell you, about uh, 2005 or six, I was over at the Reebok Euro Camp uh, in, in Italy, uh, an NBA camp, kind of like a combine for the international guys. And Coach Bob Hurley was with, over, with us over there because it was a Reebok event. And uh, one of the great teams in the 80s in, in, in world basketball was the Soviet Union. Before the breakup of the, of the country, most of their good players came from Lithuania. Sabonis, Marshallonis, I think four of their five starters when they won the gold in 88. It was, a year, it was the last year we sent college guys, Jordan. Four of their five starters from Lithuania, were from Lithuania. And you and I both know how much they love basketball in Lithuania. Um, there was a shooter on that team by the name of Reed, Remus Curtinitis, was a great European player and is now a really good coach. He showed us the continuity ball screen uh, stuff at this camp in 2006. I don't know who had run it before in the States, if anybody, but we brought it back and I started showing it at clinics. And um, it's become America's pick and roll offense. Uh, so much so that I think now all it is is just a really good defensive drill. You know, <laughs> if if you don't have counters to it, um, it, it be, and you don't have shooters because remember your four and your five man are always constantly 
stepping away out to the top of the key, the slot areas. Um, but it's a cool offense. It's got some continuity to it, obviously. Um, I showed it to my high school, my son's high school coach. And unfortunately he put the offense in and my son, uh, Matt, who's now at Villanova as the video coordinator was a really good high school point guard. The problem with that offense is if you have one great point guard, he only gets the ball in his hands once every three rotations side to side because of the continuity. So there's some great stuff about it. Um, and there's some stuff I don't like about it. The team that has run it the best, in my opinion, if you go back over the last four years and look at Australia's national team, um, they are great at that ball screen continuity because they have five or six counters and wrinkles to your defensive adjustments. And there's a perfect example of smart plays, players having an adjustment to the adjustment. So it's part of basketball at the college and high school level now. But when I see it run, oftentimes it's just run because this is the pattern and there's no reading of the defense. And I think that's not healthy. I saw that Australia team. And I think that, I don't know if it's, it's directly from this, but there are several college teams running similar wrinkles that, that they did. Yeah. I, I've seen uh, Virginia has added a little bit to it this year. I've seen Dayton run some stuff for OB Toppin, kind of like Australia did with Bogut. Uh, and, yes. uh, and Stanford is also uh, has a lot of wrinkles out of it now. So I think it, it, it is evolving, but I, I, I kind of see it like the modern day flex offense, you know, like that's it's kind of like the bare minimum to, to start a high school or a college offense. I totally agree. And to me, like the modern day flex is nothing more than a defensive drill, <laughs> you know, fighting through screens. And that's the same way. Like you can take the ball screen continuity offense without any of its wrinkles and basically turn it into a defensive drill as to how to play side pick and roll, you know, get the continuity going defensively. Well, of course, if you ice it, you pretty much blow the offense up, you know, but the point is, um, and I would, I would, I would challenge any of the, the listeners to the podcast if you just YouTube Australia, you know, pick and roll offense, and because uh, you don't, ha- you yourself don't have time to put two hours of video up, you know, on a on a tweet, obviously. But there's some really good stuff on YouTube about the Australia offense. In fact, my buddy Zach Bover from Army, who had the great uh, website there for a while, pickandpop.net. You still may be able to find the Australian, you know, continuity pick and roll offense on his site because he did a great job of it. Um, Going back to 2016, I was covering the Olympics for NBC and he was, you know, he was kind of putting video together from the Olympic Games in 2016. And Australia had um, just a great offensive, uh, you know, scheme. Let's put it that way. Off of that one basic set. And let's not, uh, I, I, you did kind of throw it in there. It sounds like you lowered your son's usage rate. Is that, is that what you were getting at in, in uh, high school? <laughs> I did. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you know, he, 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 he literally, I say this humbly, you know, he was fortunate enough to play for Tommy Amaker at Harvard, but, um, he led Dallas Fort Worth and assist two straight years. I mean, this is good basketball down here. And he, it's one of those kids that would pass first, second, and third shoot fourth. And then I'm watching the team run, uh, you know, continuity pick and roll and I'm like wait a minute he only has the ball in his hands every three times because you know you pass it you give it up it goes to the other side and you kind of wait for it to come back and so you know there's there's times where that offense actually is detrimental to having a great player or two and there's really not necessarily reads to be made like in a spread pick and roll there's it's it's more a reaction to the defense In, in continuity it's an empty ball screen and it's it's a little bit more like robotic. Almost. It's like a ball screen offense for, for a team that's not that great at running ball screens, really. You know, I've always said that's a great delay game for high school coaches because it, what, in, in states where you play with no shot clock, because you can still get easy baskets out of it. You can, on a side ball screen, you could slip it and, and cut, you know, lever and, you know, and, and slip it or out early and get a cheap layup. You can get a back cut on the other side. Um, it's a great delay game, but other than that, or you can reject the screen, you know, which my son did a lot when the ball went to the side and here comes the ball screen. Oftentimes he would reject it and go baseline. And what I would tell coaches when I showed this, the, the rudiments of the offense is look, the, the, the object of this offense is not to be robotic and just go side to side. 
somehow you got to get the ball into the painted area. And so if you can reject the ball screen, I've always been a big fan of rejecting ball screens uh, uh, when defenses cheat to the screen. And um, I just re video, I just re uh, tweeted uh, the stuff I did this summer. I know you're a fan of, I think you did, you just do the Jordan Ford uh, stuff for St. Mary's. I did recently. That did the, yep. Yep. Okay. With the spin move. I mean, that kid is a pick and roll maestro, you know, and it, and he's a genius at, at knowing when to reject ball screens. So this is all part of, I think, what we try to do as coaches, at least I try to do as a mentor to coaches, is to say, show me your offense and show me how it's going to attack certain defenses. And if I move my defense to adjust to this, how will you adjust to me? You know, and it's, it's a constant cat and mouse game. And I've, uh, I've, all, I've also, Jordan, told like both of my sons who, you know, are both coaching, um, it's so much harder as a young coach in your early to mid-20s, you know, late 20s, early 30s to learn offense than it is defense. And anytime you can be around somebody that's teaching you offense, soak it all in. Because I can get five guys right now to go out there uh, like Seton Hall did uh, to Maryland last night, play their hearts out on the defensive end. And we, I can put you in a shell drill and do shell for, you know, three or four days. And if you just pour your heart out, we can become a good defensive team with effort, you know. Um, but offense requires execution, spacing, timing, and adjusting to the defense. And many young coaches learn offense way too late in their careers. I heard you say that on Chris Oliver's podcast as well. And yeah, if, if someone reaches out to me about offense, I always say, well, I know really good offense when I see it, but teaching it is, is different. Like that's, that's, I completely agree. Uh, even in just yeah. the limited coaching experience that I have. No, but you, you have a great, I just based on all the things you've done, you know, uh, with, with, you know, with hoop vision and, and the stuff you put out, you are getting coaches to think, you know, um, and it's really important. I, I'll give you an example. Like uh, I, I, one of the things I've tried to educate college and high school coaches on, uh, and, and they're doing a better job of this, but, but over the last 15 or 20 years of my involvement in international basketball is the idea of rescreening. Uh, you know, uh, in pick and roll when defenders go under the screen. Okay. Now it's becoming more and more common, but if you go under the ball screen on my point guard, I'm going to rescreen you. Okay. If I rescreen you, then you have to have a counter to the rescreen. And one of the counters to a rescreen that I've seen is trapping the, the second side. So you, and so now you trap me because that's your adjustment to the rescreen and my screener can't roll all the way to the basket. It's too, takes too long. So what does the trap bring? The trap brings a short roll, um, into the, you know, into the high paint area where it's a little pocket pass through the double. And so that's what I mean. That's four adjustments on just one play, right? Yep. Two and two on offense, two on defense. And those are the things that I want young coaches to constantly be aware of. If I do this, what's your counter? And if you counter me, what's my counter to that? And the minute my players don't have, uh, they think I don't have an answer for what the defense is doing, they're going to lose confidence in their coach. To wrap up on, I guess, the, the trends from, from your head coaching days to now, the last topic I had in mind was ball screen defense. Mm -hmm. How were you guarding ball screens as a head coach? And how has that evolved in the last 10, 20 years? Well, I worked at a Steve Nash Nike point guard camp about 10, 12 years ago. And, and Steve played in Dallas, obviously, before he went to Phoenix. So I made my home in Dallas. And he's very approachable. You know, we're not name dropping here. He's just one of those guys that if you or I saw him at a, at a shopping mall, assuming he's not busy with his family, or if you saw him at a Starbucks, he would give you time and would be very polite. And you could, you could, you know, you could talk basketball with him. And I once asked him about pick and roll coverages. I said, what gives you the most trouble? And he said, none of them give me trouble because I've had thousands of reps versus the seven, eight or nine defensive coverages that I've seen in my career in the NBA. And I have a, here's the great word here. I have a solution for every coverage. 
And I thought that was a brilliant term, you know, a solution, because that's what we're doing as coaches. We're finding solutions. And so um, it's no different than Tom Brady or, or Drew Brees or Peyton Manning playing 15 years and seeing hundreds and thousands of blitzes and feeling it. Do you remember when Tony Romo started uh, on TV last year and how he, he kind of felt like he knew what was coming? Predicting the future, yep, well, yep. He predicted the future because he knew the future because he saw the he saw the alignments he saw where everybody was moving to and he knew what where, where the blitz was coming. Yep. And it's very similar, you know. So going back when we were coaching, we we very rarely switched. We usually hard hedged, and um, and and pretty much that was that was it. You know, it was you it was usually a hard hedge, then blitzing and trapping it was came in vogue in the nineties. Pat Riley, NBA, you know, and then switching and then, you know, flat hedges and drop and drop coverages because big guys weren't mobile out there. So, you know, I, I think, I think that when it comes to both pick and roll offense and pick and roll defense, the question you have to ask as a coach is who, and let's go defense for a second. Who are the players in the coverage and what are they physically capable of doing? Like, do we want Boban Marjanovic hard hedging, you know, 25 feet away from the basket in an NBA game? Of course not. You know, he's going to be in drop coverage. Can a more athletic guy hard hedge or switch? Probably. Uh, can we be a proficient enough to ice a side pick and roll to keep it on that side of the floor? Sure. Um, same thing with weak coverage when we force the ball to the left side in a high pick and roll. So I think, I think there's been an evolving again, getting back to what I said earlier, you know, you got to know how to, how to uh, anticipate and, and, and evolve your style of pick and roll offense and defense based on your players, their players, um, the coverages your kids are comfortable with. And then at the high school and college level, I don't think you can, again, it gets back to what I said very early. You know, I wouldn't be a guy that had eight coverages. Um, in high school or college, I think you pick out one or two basic coverage coverages that you work on throughout the year, maybe a third emergency coverage and get good at those three, as opposed to, um, you know, trying to be great at a whole bunch. And offensively, you have to have an answer for every coverage, a solution. And it's up to the coach to have those solutions to get to work with his players on, um, in order to attack the coverages. And, uh, you know, it's definitely evolved over 20 years. It's more complicated. On the staffs that I worked on, I feel like it was a, a head coach versus assistant coach kind of thing where, where the head coach especially wants to keep it simple, do, if we're sticking with <laughs> ball screen coverages, do what yeah. they do really, really well. And then the assistant coaches are like, well, I, maybe we should ice this game or maybe we should flat edge this yeah. game or, or even <laughs> in a timeout, like at the under 16 or something, maybe we should switch it here. You know, it's like a, it's a dynamic going on there. Well, I was the same way as an assistant. Trust me, believe <laughs> me. Um, we have, you know, I, I remember probably in your, when you were at New Mexico state or when I was at Ohio, U, I had all the answers <laughs> as an assistant. Um, but the key, the key is again, be good at one or two coverages or be great at them. You know, I I think that's important. Be great at a couple coverages. And then if you can sprinkle in, you know, another emergency coverage that you think, uh, uh, let me put it this way. You got to be able to prepare to beat the best three teams on your schedule every year. And there are things that maybe you do for most teams that you may have to change for the best team on your schedule but you can't put that defense in for the best team on your schedule two two days before you play them. You better be working on that in, in September, October, and November, even if you don't see that team in February until February. So there's a there's a pull and push there that has to have the proper balance when you're a coach putting together you know a defensive scheme. Let's say. So I want to switch gears here. I've been very excited to bring this quote up and and have a conversation about it. I feel like you're you're well known for it. Statistics accuse, analytics <laughs> indict, videotape convicts. Can you uh, yes. explain that a little bit? Sure, sure. You know, uh, I, I mentioned to you off air that it, w- it was about 2004 or so that I discovered Ken Palm stats, you know, and I was blown away. 
And, you know, quickly thereafter, guys like Chris Mack and Sean Miller and some others. And then our guys at ESPN picked up on this. And, you know, I mean, Ken Palm opened up our world to uh, things that we thought were happening in games, but we could never quantify because we didn't have the time. And, you know, I was keeping analytics as a head coach 25 years ago. We just didn't know it. Like we charted deflections. We charted uh, what I what I used to call um, Jasper assists, which are now called virtual assists. You know, a pass that leads to a great shot or a two shot foul. I used to reward my players with a Jasper assist because if I throw Jordan Sperber the ball and he gets fouled at the basket and it's going to go to the line, I don't get a I don't get credit for an assist. But we rewarded our guys based on the film. So. The the idea I came up with, and again, it's not revolutionary. I mean, I think it really makes sense. Is like statistics are good. You know, they give you a story. They tell you, you think they tell a story. The analytics really dive in a little closer. Um, and you know, analytics can watch every single game. I can't. I can only watch the games I have time to watch on tape. I might see something on a tape that tells me something, and then I'll use the Ken Palm. Uh, numbers to see if that backs up what I'm actually seeing. So in my 40 or so years of being around basketball, I've, I've educated my eye to the point where I have a good feel for what I'm looking for, but Ken Palm numbers and uh, hoop math and all these other numbers that I get to look at as a fan and as an ad TV analyst, they oftentimes corroborate what I think my eyes show me. And sometimes when they don't, I have to look a little closer at the film to see why they they don't correspond. So uh, I, I've heard the f- phrase before, statistics accuse, videotape convicts. And then it just seemed natural that when analytics and Ken Palm numbers came along, that we just stuck in there the, in, the indictment part. So, um, But I, I think your eyes got to tell you what you're seeing. But you, if, you're, if you're not a guy that's uh, into the numbers nowadays – I think you're missing out on a huge part of the game and the way it's being played and how it's being played. More importantly, even when I'm watching film, my gut instinct is I want to start counting things. And I don't know if (laughs) if you're similar, but like to me, they they just go so hand in hand with each other. Like you can have opinions about film from your gut or you can count. Okay. We hedged the ball screen 12 times and this is how we did on on those hedges. Uh, So really to me, it's like the line between analytics, statistics and film really gets blurred and exactly the opposite too. I see that a team leads the country in their offense ending in cuts. And now I want to watch that team to see why, you know, it's like, it's never really one yeah. or the other for me at least. Right. And it's a, uh, it, it's a, uh, they, they all kind of blend together and oftentimes they, they don't tell, no, no, you know, that's what I call, you know, again, problem solving, finding solutions, detective work, you know, there's things that you might see based on, uh, you know, uh, an analytical number that makes you want to dive into the tape and find out why. And that's the great thing about basketball or any sport that you're involved with, that you have this love for uh, finding solutions and figuring out why things happen, you know, and, uh, this is a pretty basic, uh, stat, but I remember five or six years ago when, Bob Huggins was coming off of under 500 year and they got a bunch of, they had six guards and um, he was convinced by Kevin Mackey, an NBA scout, Indiana Pacers, former coach at Cleveland state. He said, Bob, and he's got this Boston accent. He goes, you got six guards, you know, <laughs> in a Boston side, he goes, you're not going to score in your half court. So press Virginia was invented, you know, 40 minutes of random running and jumping and trapping and you're watching the tape and you're seeing early box scores from that first year. And you're seeing that the turnover numbers are huge. And then you're going to the Ken Palm stuff and they're turning people over at a, at a rate of three times every 10 possessions, which is incredible. And then you dive into the film and you see why and, and vice versa. You know, it happens the other way too. You're watching film and you go, damn, I wonder what their TO rate is, you know? And, so it's it's a constant back and forth, and it's uh, it's fun, 
to to watch what you do and break teams down and break break schemes down and show show why you know plays work and why they don't work and what trends are and uh so the numbers and the video and what our eyes are telling us and what our head is telling us all, all kind of blends together and that's the fun part of uh you know how we enjoy you know watching the game the next thing that we usually talk about on this podcast is communicating the numbers so you mentioned some, yep. something like the jasper assists was that yes. internal for your coaching staff or were you also sharing that information with players it's a great question i used to keep stats that rewarded my players for the it gets it's get it gets back to this now jordan you asked me earlier about what what you wanted to be good at and how did you know what the three things were well I talked about effort, right? Let's take an effort stat, okay? For example, we were huge on effort. You mentioned the offensive rebounding, which I wasn't aware of at St. John's, but we used to keep uh, one of the stats we kept internally with our players and coaches was when we graded the film, we charted offensive rebounds attempted. So, for example, we always wanted, again, because the way we created our offense, when a shot went up, we almost always had two guys going to the backside uh, and usually our four and our five, if they weren't involved in the offensive set. So you shoot a jumper from the right wing, you could almost guarantee that four and five were going to the backside. Okay. To try to create uh, an opportunity for an offensive rebound. So when we try, and that's part of our DNA, it's part of what we practice. So when we charted it on video, if I sent three, four, and five to the glass and my four man got the rebound, but we could tell that three and five were making an an excellent effort to get inside of the defense. And maybe they jumped or maybe four tipped it, kept it alive and five came down with it. We rewarded all three players with an offensive rebound attempted. My thinking being, well, the more we go to the glass, the more offensive rebounds we're going to get. And the more we reward effort, because if you jump a lot higher than me, but we still make the same effort and you get the rebound, I still want, I still want to, I want, I want to be rewarded for making the effort. So typically in a game, we would get 75 offensive rebounds attempted. And that would often correlate to the job we did on the offensive glass. So there were lots of stats like that that I rewarded my players for effort or the way we wanted to play, making the extra pass, you know, the Jasper assists, the deflections was another effort, you know, uh, effort based stat that we could go to the film on that UB Brown and Rick Patino came up with in the early eighties. Uh, and that now everybody uses right to, mm-hmm. you know, to, uh, to signify effort. So I tried to reward players with, with stats that showed effort that showed teamwork that didn't show up on a box score, but, but, but let them know we appreciate your effort because you're playing the way we want you to play. And, you know, again, I jokingly say that we were doing analytics, you know, 25 years ago, we just didn't call it that. (laughs) I had uh, Kyle Smith on, on the pod. He was at San Francisco at the time and he's kind of built his coaching philosophy. He calls them the hustle stats, but it's not just hustle. Yeah. He, he quantifies yeah. everything. And he's gone a step further than I think some coaches do in that it does directly affect playing time. So in, in, yes. your, in your experience, were your best players, your best, like wh- wh- whatever you call them, hustle stats or, or whatever, or was it difficult to hold players accountable because you want to get the right guys on the court? Well, a couple things. Number one, Kyle's a genius. Um, I, honestly, uh, and I say that half half seriously. He's a great basketball coach. Um, I watched them play last night. They won easily. You know, he will he will definitely improve Washington State. Uh, I, uh, I love talking basketball with him, and I love that podcast. I heard every word of it. It was a great great podcast. I work out about an hour a day. And I remember that day I was, I was walking through Dallas in a hundred degree heat in the summer and listen to the podcast. So that's the first thing, but no, I think it's part of your culture. Like I, Kelvin Sampson says something that I love. He said, three guys that can never have a bad day in practice, the head coach, the point guard, and the best player. And my best players um, were almost always my hardest workers. And 
So it's not always the case, as we both know, but I tried to recruit to that, that our, our best players were the guys that gave, you know, that I wanted to be our team leaders and they had to be hard workers. So uh, it really became, um, you know, Kyle did take it to even the nth degree, which we didn't do at the time, but we definitely promoted effort as a way of playing time. But quite frankly, if your best players aren't your hardest workers, you got a problem. And I know Kyle, you know, held some guys accountable to playing time, which I think is phenomenal. Um, I didn't go that far, but I definitely, I think in college, you can recruit effort. You can recruit guys that bring effort. Otherwise you're going to have a very miserable time coaching somebody in a program that values effort, hard work, intensity, and they're not intense themselves. There are times where you can foster intensity in practice by the way you, by the way you set up your drills, by the players that you put around a certain player. Um, but if, if inherently your best players aren't your, you know, hardest workers, you're going to, you're not going to have fun coaching as much as you would if they were. So you said that, that you were charting things and really doing analytics without knowing that, that it was called that as a head coach. And then we're early to the Kempom train and getting other coaches and, and media involved. Is there anything from earlier in your career that didn't hold up with some of the, I guess the, the lowest hanging fruit would be shot selection. Is there anything that, that you yeah. think would be different if, if you're coaching now? Well, I'm sure there would be because there's so much more information, you know, um, you know, but a lot of the things were pretty basic and still germane, even today, germane to winning. Uh, we charted uncontested shots allowed. Um, we, we felt that, uh, any more than four uncontested shots allowed in the game was too high. So we put a pre- if you go back and look at the, my team's numbers at Manhattan, particularly, and even at St. John's, we were, we were, I think one year, um, one year we were in the top 10 in both field goal offense and field goal defense at Manhattan and nationally, but, um, nothing that jumps out because are the things that we did were fairly, you know, are still germane to winning like contesting shots, like rebounding on both ends of the floor, like, you know, the hustle plays, like deflections, uh, offensive rebounds attempted. It was nothing out of the ordinary back then that we kept that I would say wouldn't fit into the modern game today. Obviously, we're way more sophisticated when it comes to the numbers, but uh, we weren't so sophisticated back then that we were, you know, in that Kyle Smith range. Um, uh, because, um, you know, that, uh, what they do at, at what they've done at Columbia, San Francisco, and now Washington state is, I would say over the top in a positive way, you know, um, because it, it fits exactly their philosophy of how they can, uh, you know, analyze what, what goes into winning. So we weren't that complicated back then. I think all those things that we kept are still pretty relevant today on that same Chris Oliver podcast that you did that I mentioned before so, something mm-hmm. um you said that uh <laughs> that I thought was pretty funny is that the analytics guy is always the youngest on the staff I, I could definitely relate to that <laughs> I could relate to that yeah it's great oh it's great you know like it's guy you know you know the worst thing an older coach can do is not try to get better and, uh, you know, it's just, you know, back, honestly, now you have to remember, I started, I was a full-time assistant in 1980. We literally still had the reel-to-reel film. And then it went to Betamax, and then it went to VHS, and now it's digital, and now it's, you know, now now it's analytics, and now it's, uh, you know, second spectrum where you have it. And it's just mind-blowing the way, you know, the game has changed. And quite frankly, you know, um, when it comes to technology, many of us, you know, older coaches and older guys are just, uh, you know, we're technologically illiterate, which is why I'm glad I have two sons in their twenties. <laughs> they taught me, they taught me how to use Twitter. They try to teach me how to use, uh, you know, uh, some of the modern technology, but I think it's absolutely imperative for a, a, a young, uh, you know, man or woman who's getting into coaching to have, uh, the technological background that you see today, you know, my older guy, James, uh, is, uh, on the video staff with the magic. And, uh, you know, he's been messing around with cameras since he was five years old and that's what he's always loved. And that 
combination of basketball and video has, you know, c- carved out a niche for him. So critical that older coaches figure it out. And if they don't figure it out, they better have guys on the staff that, uh, you know, can put together, uh, you know, the technology that makes it easier to watch a game on your laptop or, or cut ups of all the pick and roll plays of your opponent or whatever it is, you know, offensive tendencies of each player makes life so much easier than the way we learned it, you know, uh, 30 and 35 years ago. One thing from my experiences that I learned is because analytics is like this separate thing. So normally the, the video coordinator for, for listeners that, that aren't as familiar with the insides of, of college basketball They'll work really closely with the assistant coaches on things like scouting and um, basically trying to determine a game plan for the head coach to ultimately make a decision on. But maybe the the video guy who, who's young is talking yep. directly to assistant coaches and not so much skipping a step to go to the head coach. It's like a pecking order. And with, right. with right. analytics, it was a little bit different because no one else on the staff is is like the the has the knowledge responsibility the knowledge. or knowledge yeah, yeah. Exa- and yeah. and so th- it was an interesting dynamic where i was doing i was trying to produce information about scouting and even about recruiting we we use numbers for for recruiting and in both of those cases there's an assistant coach in charge of that the lead recruiter or the lead scouter and you had to learn pretty early on that you need to have a good relationship with with those guys and not go over their back. Um, and I yeah. think that it's something that as analytics is getting more and more prevalent and people are making decisions off of it. But it is the youngest person on the staff and the least experienced. And I mean, just to be frank, the, the, the least paid, too. Uh, so there's that whole yes. dynamic there. Yes. Of, of managing how this information is being uh, applied. I would say that starts from the top. I think the head coach has got to be able to have a staff that understands, look, we don't care how we get this job done, whether it's signing a player or beating an opponent. Everybody has an important contribution to make. And so, you know, from the standpoint that you're talking about, which I have seen on many staffs now, good and bad staff dynamics, one of the things – that has to set the tone as the head coach creates an environment that everybody's in this together and you check your ego at the door. And that's not always easy, you know, for, um, you know, for, for coaches, uh, you know, especially when there's somebody on the staff that has, like you said, uh, the knowledge of the analytics that they may not have, but again, it's incumbent upon anybody who's going to get into this business you know, going forward to have a work, you know, have a definite working knowledge of both how analytics work, how the video component works. Um, I just think it's going to be part of the new era of, uh, you know, of, of coaching. And, and, um, and again, you got to check your ego at the door along those lines. There's one thing I want to mention to you that I think is really critical for younger coaches. And that is, and I've told both my boys is to have a, it's a little outside of the box here, but you have to have a knowledge of what mental health means in the 21st century. Um, these kids that you're coaching because of social media, because of stress and pressure to be whatever, an NBA player or a really good college player or to fit in on the team. Um, I think we used to say when I was a young coach, hey, come on, suck it up, you know, get tough, whatever. Totally different dynamic nowadays you really have to know what makes these young people tick and you have to be really aware of these mental health aspects as Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan have pointed out even in the NBA and those guys are millionaires so you know young this is a good time to be a young basketball coach because there's so many things at your you know at your uh, you know uh, that are there for you to to get better at um but it's it's constantly evolving and, and all encompassing, and uh, you know most of the guys like yourself who've done this do it for very little money at the start, and none of us got into this business for the money. We just because we did it because we love basketball. You know, guys now in your age range have way more at their fingertips than I did. You know, when I started forty years ago. 
Well, last thing here, it was actually really what what I had planned for this podcast, but we just went almost an hour talking basketball, so it, yeah. it's great. It's great. <laughs> um, yep. But yep. just just to end here, you tweeted your scouting report, or uh, I'm not exactly sure what what you TV chart. It. Yeah, my TV chart. Yeah, your TV chart, which. I'll send out a link to that tweet when I uh, put this yeah. podcast out, but it was your, your preparation for, for one of your TV games. And so just to end here, um, I wanted to ask you really how that gets created, what, you, what your uh, workflow is like to create that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that TV chart is basically what I used to call a short scouting report that I turned it into a TV chart for myself and now I've got Seth Greenberg, Ben Braun, Matt Doherty, and probably five others at least that use that chart. Because when they got into TV, they'd say, well, how do you, how do you remember all this stuff? So I, I, I'd send out my TV chart. I love to help guys out, so I have no problem with it. But when we used to do a 60-page report, and you may remember this at New Mexico State, you know, the report looks like a mini, you know, it looks like a little magazine. Well, we couldn't give players 60 pages, so what we would do is use that two page front and back as what we called a short scouting report, all the pertinent, all the pertinent information. And, uh, I turned that in over the 17 years I've been at ESPN into a TV uh, chart, put all my information as much as I can fit on there. You know, I went to Catholic school. So my penmanship is, you know, nearly flawless, you know, (laughs) thanks to the nuns. And, um, I, when someone asked me about preparation, Jordan, I have to explain to them, like, it's for me, it's 365 days a year. I don't have a job. I'm blessed that I'm around basketball every day. I read every day of the year. I watch tape. So my summers are my summers. I spend studying up on the upcoming season from 30,000 feet. And then as I get closer to the season and I know what my schedule is, I already know I'm going to have Tennessee at Georgia on January 15th. So yesterday I spent about an hour and a half watching Anthony Edwards, the great player who's probably a top three pick. And so I, I tried to study the game in a way that it's going to help me prepare for, you know, the upcoming games. And, uh, if I'm, if I'm doing a Tennessee Val, Val, Val Georgia game, I'll probably put 10 hours of work in for that game, film, reading, et cetera. And it takes me about two hours to do one of those TV charts that, that you saw. Um, but it is not work. This is kind of in my DNA. And I've been very lucky that my whole adult life has been around a game I love. I've gotten paid to do something that I would do for free, um, you know, but I'm, I'm blessed. And so when I do a TV chart like I, the one I did for Houston, I want to know everything about that team. I want to know everything about Kelvin Sampson, who's a friend who I've known a long time. And I want to tell somebody about the broadcast. We, I don't know, you probably didn't see the game, but we did Kelvin's monster trap in the post. And, you know, we, we showed it early in the game, how they trap big to big. And to, to Oklahoma State's credit, Mike Boynton had an offense for the, you know, he had a solution, right, for the monster trap. And they scored three or four times on it. So I like to very simply – tell somebody about the game they're watching about a player coach or team that they've never heard before. Even if you've seen me broadcast Kansas 12 times, which I'll probably do this year. (laughs) Uh, It's a labor of love and it's what I love to do. And I love to educate. I love to teach. I love to mentor. And it's uh, provided me uh, a great way to stay close to the game. Well, thank you very much. I think that this podcast was an example of, of teaching the game, and I really appreciate your time and, and your support of Hoop Vision in general. I love it. Keep it up. Uh, it's great. And um, anytime I see it pop up on Twitter, I go, what does Jordan have for us next? So <laughs> it, it's really good, and I'm glad to contribute a little bit. Hand checking Michael Jordan, Scott Pippen, Tony Kuko. Uh, uh, uh.